we are in our second the second webinar of our series leading into the future thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to interacting with you today my name is pam mcnaughton i've been working for cpas for the last seven years for those of you who don't know cpas is an anglican mission ag agency and we work in this country uh, and we seek to resource church leaders to lead churches in mission throughout the uk and ireland we run holidays for children and young people and we act as patrons to around 670 churches. If you'd like to know more about CPAS, um, the link will keep appearing in the chat and you can click on that to look on our website. In a moment, we're going to pray together, but let me just ask James, uh, who's going to speak for us today, to introduce himself. Hi, good morning, everyone. James Lawrence also worked for CPAS and uh, delighted to be with you this morning. And um, we're going to be thinking about uh, our second sort of topic for leading into the future. And we've called this leading through the recovery phase because we think there is an opportunity coming up for us in the not too distant future uh, to put our churches at the centre of our communities and Christ at the centre of people's lives. So we're actually quite excited about this webinar. We've created a whole bunch of new resources and materials for it, which we'll be telling you more about later on. So really looking forward to spending this next hour engaging around this theme with you. Thank you, James. Um, after we've heard from James, we'll have some time in breakout rooms to process the things he said, to come up with questions for our third section when we all come back together for some Q&A. Um, at the end of the webinar at 11, if you would like to stay on, we will stay on for a bit for further questions, but we'll end officially at 11. We'd like to pray for our time together, and I've got some verses from Isaiah 55 that may be very familiar. Let's pray. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, make it, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Loving God, go with us in all our thinking and learning and pondering today. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, James. Over to you. Uh, Pam, do you want to just say something about the chat facility and uh, how to post into chat? Oh, yes. If you would like to add questions or comments in chat as we go through, please do. If you can remember, please put your questions in capital letters so that they're easy to spot for the Q&A at the end. Thanks, James. Great, thank you. Well, good morning to those who've just arrived. Lovely to see you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, we're going to dive into our topic for this morning. Uh, you should have received in the um, email we sent out with joining instructions a link to take you through to where you can download the handouts. And if they're helpful to have, then do make use of those as we go through this next uh, few minutes together. Uh, I have tweaked them ever so slightly uh, from when we sent them out yesterday, so apologies for that, but uh, there's not a lot of difference. And we will be recording this session, uh, so it will be available for you in the next week or so. And what we want to focus on in this particular webinar is leading through the recovery phase. And to do that, I want to remind you of two things that we've mentioned on webinars before. Last year, we offered you a phrase uh, to help us as we think about how to lead when everything remains so uncertain. And we talked about think long term, prepare medium term and plan short term. And one of the ways of sort of imaging that would be a little bit like this. Um, as leaders, we need to keep our eyes on the longer term because leadership is about going somewhere. But in a time of uncertainty, where things constantly keep changing, it's hard to plan for the long term. So we keep our eyes on the long term. We think long term. It's why many of us may be thinking at the moment about what we're going to do about 
a hybrid reality of online and on-site for the future. We prepare medium term, knowing that there's a likelihood that things will turn out as we anticipate on this timescale, but we still can't be certain. And that's why for the last few weeks, many of us have been preparing for Lent and for Easter. It's in that sort of medium term window. And then we can plan in detail for the short term because we can be pretty confident in the short term, things will work out as we're anticipating. And the timescales for that, which we introduced last year were something like this. I want to suggest the horizons have possibly shifted a little bit in these last few months. And they may look maybe a little bit more um, uh, like this. So as we think long-term, prepare medium-term and plan short-term, uh, we're going to be thinking today about something which is in that medium term area. Here's the second thing I want to remind us of. Uh, what happens after a crisis? And this is from that video many of you will have seen from Simon Barrington of the three phases of responding to a crisis. Uh, the initial phase is that response phase. It's the period where you quickly have to make lots of changes according to what's going on. And the key people key skills which are needed at that time are those activists and planners. There's just stuff that needs to be done and needs to be done quickly. Uh, the recovery phase is um, a longer phase and is certainly going to take a, a good number of months. And in that phase, you need folks who are more people focused, a little bit more pastoral in their orientation because they're key to doing well in that recovery phase. And then the third phase is what we call the reconstruction phase. And that takes a lot longer, it runs into years following a crisis. And at that point, you need people who bring the strategic thinking gifts and uh, keep us focused around purpose and values. Now, of course, life isn't as neat as just three neat phases, response, recovery and reconstruction. They, they actually get woven into one another. But overall, as a process for understanding what happens following something like the prior crisis we've been through. It's a really helpful guide, response, recovery, and reconstruction. And we want to suggest that in the medium term, we are probably heading into the recovery phase. And we recognize, of course, people are at different stages because they're impacted differently by the pandemic and, and people process differently. But overall, we think we're probably heading into that recovery phase in the months to come. Uh, I think that's true in terms of the vaccination program. I actually think it's true in terms of the season as we head into spring. And I think it may also be true for us liturgically as we go through Lent into Easter and into the post Easter season. Now, when exactly that recovery phase is the one for us to focus on as leaders will differ from community to community. But I've got a hunch that it's almost certainly going to be post Easter, but now is the time to be doing the thinking about that recovery phase so that we're prepared and ready for it and ready to make the most of the opportunity that it offers to us, which is why we've chosen to focus this webinar on recovery and how we might help our congregations, ourselves, and our communities go through that recovery phase. Well, before I dive into how we might do that, we're going to do one of our little polls again. And uh, Pam's going to launch the poll for us. You'll find there are three questions on it this time. And uh, Pam, if you can launch that poll for us, it's come up on the screen. And uh, the first question there we used last time, there are, you, we're inviting you to choose up to three options for that first question. Just interested to see how you're feeling as a leader at this point. Then you'll need to scroll down through the screen to the second question where you'll have a single option that you can choose. And then uh, the third question is just for interest for ourselves, I'm afraid, be grateful if you could just answer that. Now, we know that on some devices, you can't actually see the poll. Apologies for that. Uh, it's due to the device that you're on, but the majority of us will be able to. So answer the first question, three possible options. Second question, third question. You'll need to answer each question and then hit the submit button at the bottom. And I'll give you about a minute to do that now. Just go with your gut response. Don't overthink it. How are we doing on the results, Pam? Yeah, we've got about 59%, 60. Okay, yeah. great. 
80. Hold on, folks. Thank you. This is really helpful to us. Okay, maybe just 10 more seconds. Yeah, 88%. That's great. Apologies again to those of you who can't do it, uh, but uh, the majority will be able to. Someone's saying it won't submit. Have, you've got to answer all three questions in order to submit it. Um, so just check you have answered all three questions. And again, apologies if there's technical difficulties, which means that not everybody's going to be able to do it, but the majority will. OK, Pam, let's close the poll and share the results. Uh -huh. Great. OK, so there we are uh, in that first category. Um, hopeful is the highest percentage. Um, interestingly, uh, significantly up uh, on last time we did that last month. But again, fatigued is the second highest one, I think. And that was the case both uh, uh, for last month as well, hopeful and fatigued. Uh, in the second question, when we think we might go into that recovery phase, April, May, June, yeah, I think it's unlikely, as the poll suggests, it's going to be March. It could be much later and it will vary from community to community. But April seems to be about the right time. And, and I think that's probably right, which is why we've chosen to give the focus of this webinar to how we might plan and prepare for that recovery. Great. Pam, if you want to close the poll and I will reshare my screen. And we'll explore together a little bit on how might we lead through the recovery phase. And folks, the first thing I want to say is this. Ultimately, the most important thing we can do is point people to Jesus. I was preaching on Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 29 to 39 uh, uh, last Sunday. And I love that passage. It's the one where he teaches in the synagogue all day, comes home, heals Simon's mother-in-law. Then the crowds gather outside his door and he heals the sick and drives out the demons. And then if you remember, the next morning, he gets up early in the morning while it's still dark, goes to a solitary place and prays to his heavenly father. And in his time of prayer, it's almost as though Jesus is recalibrated and realizes that the adulation of the crowd the night before, when his disciples come to him and say, everyone is looking for you, he realizes he's not to go back to the crowd but to press on to other villages to proclaim the good news of the gospel in other places. And I think we see in that passage the extraordinary things that Jesus can do in people's lives in terms of healing and deliverance and in terms of the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus, of the gospel. So, folks, ultimately, we want to point people to Jesus because he's the one who will restore people to health, mind, body and soul. Ultimately, we want help to help people encounter Jesus. And I want to suggest that there's an approach and an action that we can take that might help us to do that. So Simon Barrington speaks of an approach uh, during the recovery phase that requires both an ability to look forward and backward. Recovery requires an honest engagement with what has happened, but also a clear focus on what is to come. He also talks about the importance of reflection and learning, uh, aided by helping people both to reflect on what has been and to identify what they've learned through the process, the, the situation of the pandemic. He talks thirdly about it being an important uh, period where we focus on people, um, in that initial response phase to a pandemic, there's lots of stuff to sort out. But in this phase, we really want to focus on people. And that's why we need those pastoral folks to guide us through this time. And this is what we do well as a church. And therefore, we've got a great thing to offer into the wider community. And third, fourthly, he talks about in the approach to the recovery phase, the importance of what he calls emotional engagement that the multiple deprivations of the last year are seen in the emotions being expressed at this time and that we need to engage with those realities and also recognise many folks are looking forward to a time where they can hopefully re-engage with things they enjoy. 
And so I want to suggest, given that approach, there are two activities that we can focus on, creating spaces and offering processes. I can't think of a better word. There probably is one. If you can think of a better one, let me know in the chat later. But creating spaces and offering processes. Uh, for us as a leader, for those we lead, those in our congregation and those in our community. So let me make some suggestions about what that might look like. I think at the heart of what we are doing, uh, we want to help people walk through the three stages of recovery. Remembering, and that involves remembering losses of people and of things. I think of my 89 year old mother who is is lamenting the loss of every week and every month that has passed in lockdown because she knows she's not got many years left and she longs to make the most of the last years of her life. And the remembering also involves remembering with thanksgiving all that others have done for us and all the signs of God's provision within this period. So we remember. We reflect. And in the reflecting, we reflect on what we have learned through the experience and what we long to do differently in the future. And then we look to recuperate. And as we look forward, we look forward to reconnecting again with families and friends. We look forward to things that will restore us, getting away for a holiday. Goodness me, I can't wait to do that again. Uh, maybe for some going back to work to a workplace that they're missing. We look forward to serving those in need in ways that we used to and have not been able to do. We look forward to sport and coffee shops. There's so many things that we can look forward to. So three things that are at the heart of this recovery, remember, reflect and recuperate. So how might we do that for ourselves? Well, for you as a leader, here are four little suggestions I'd like to offer you. Book a conversation with someone outside your context, where you can process your own experience of the pandemic. And it may need to be several conversations, conversation with a friend, conversations with a mentor, conversations with a spiritual director. In all of this, we need to go through the recovery process ourselves. I know many of us as leaders are fatigued, We've been struggling with multiple demands and responsibilities, and actually we need to recover. So booking a conversation or a series of conversation with, those, with someone who can support us is a good thing to be doing at this stage. I met with my spiritual director just a few weeks ago. I've got another one in the diary in a couple of months time. It's been so helpful to process some of my own experience in that conversation. Secondly, Create space in your diary for thinking and praying about how you're going to lead others through the recovery phase. We've talked before, haven't we, about the power of just 30 minutes a week. Um, if we're going to lead others through recovery, we're going to need to put some time in our diary to pray and to ponder. Thirdly, plan a break, even if it can't be a holiday. Half term's coming up. Uh, maybe you could take some time off. Easter will be coming up. Maybe there's some time off after Easter. But let's not go through the first four months of this year without taking some time to take a break. Yes, we can't take a holiday as we would like to, but actually we'll need to take a break to give ourselves some space, some energy, uh, some restoring time so we're ready for what is to come. And maybe, again, it's time to just take a little review of how our habits are, what our rhythms are like, uh, there's a long way still to go on this pandemic journey. I was talking to a vicar who said that she deliberately slowed down in January to give herself some space for some recovery. She kept working, but she slowed down. She did less than she would normally do because she knew she needed recovery time so she could keep going and be ready for this ongoing journey that we're in. Well, maybe there are four things we might think about doing for ourselves as we look to recover well through this process. What about for those you lead with? And we've talked uh, throughout this pandemic about the importance of leading with others, whether that's one person 
inside or outside your context who you just arrange to tap with once a week about what's going on and share your thoughts and ideas and pray with them or whether it's a covid response team of two or three people who are going to help you plan this recovery phase or whether it's leaning into leaders that the structure provides your pcc church wardens elders licensed ministers or whether it's leading into uh, an established leadership team we are much more likely to lead well through this recovery phase if we are leading with someone else. And we've created a range of materials for you to use. Uh, we've included some of the slides from this PowerPoint that you could share with those you're going to lead well with. We've created a, um, a whole guide to how to lead well through this recovery phase. We've got some other linked resources. Uh, I'll show you a bit more of those later on, but they're there to help you lead with others through this recovery phase. What about for those in your congregations? Well, there's a whole range of things we can help do to help our congregations go through the recovery phase um, around services, events and homes. And we've again created a bunch of resources that might help with this. We've created a, a service outline that you could use as part of the recovery phase. We've created a, an event that you could do on Zoom, a sort of 40 minute event on Zoom, not a service per se, but just a, a way of walking people through some of this recovery process. Um, we've created some materials that you could use within a home and offer to people to use to reflect on their own pandemic experience. A whole range of different things that might be helpful as people process the pandemic. We've created ones for adults to use. We've also created one for a family to use if they'd like to use that as a way of thinking and processing what's gone on uh, around remember, reflect and recuperate. These particular resources for people using in their homes are editable PDFs, so you can, where it's got your church name, you can put your church name and contact details on them and then save them and then distribute them widely to whoever you think might be helpful. So there are a range of things that we can do within our services, with some special events and with resources for the home to help people through the recovery phase. And then what about our community, for those in our communities that we're called to serve? This is a great opportunity to build on our new online fringe, to connect with those that we've served within our communities and we've got new connections with. And it may be a great opportunity also to reconnect with the new de-churched who have not been attending anything since the pandemic started. And again, there are some suggestions around buildings and how we might, when we can open up our buildings, create spaces within our buildings for people to come and find some resources to help them process. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the frontline workers that are desperate at this time knew that a church building or the church yard was a space they could go to find some ways to process their own experiences. Well, we've created a guide on how you might use your buildings or your churchyard, your premises in that way. Again, there's an event for use online uh, that might help people process. You could invite your community to and some suggestions about how to invite. And then we've got a specific guide that we've created for some people to use in their homes who don't come to church. And it's a little different for those who do come to church but nonetheless walks them through how to process their own experience of the pandemic. And in all of this, we're looking to connect with people through um, the networks that we have within our communities to offer resources, spaces for people to process their recovery. Well, as I come to a close, I want to suggest this is a great opportunity for us as churches. Of course, recovery is a process over time and not a moment. And of course, we're going to need to be wise about when to roll this out in our particular communities. It'll look different and the timing will be different for different places. But our hunch is this recovery phase is coming probably after Easter. And now is the time to be thinking about it. I know we're all caught up with Lent and Easter, and I know there's masses to be done, but if we can just find a little bit of time with a few others to be thinking about this now, preparing medium term, we'll be ready for when the recovery phase comes. 
we have a great opportunity to help people within our churches and in our communities to recover well. We are perhaps uniquely able to offer help across the nations through the outposts of God's kingdom that the local church represents and through the incredible resources available to us within the Christian tradition. There's no one way of doing this, but let's not miss the opportunity to build on our relationships. Let's connect with people and let's help the country recover and people process their pandemic experience in a healthy way. Let's help the church be at the center of our communities and Christ be at the center of people's lives. Let's be the light on the hill that Jesus talked about and draw people to the light of the world. Pam, back to you. James, thank you so much. There's such a lot to think about there and some really visionary ideas um, for the way ahead. So folks, we're going to put you in breakout rooms for 15 minutes. Um, do introduce yourselves to one another, do appoint someone maybe to um, keep track of the conversation and give everyone the chance to speak. Um, if you have questions, please note them and then you can ask them um, in the chat when we come back. Uh, if you want to reopen the chat when you're in your group, then you'll be able to see the things that are there. Thank you so much for engaging so far and have a really productive 15 minutes. See you later. Welcome back. Please be thinking about putting your questions in the chat. Be really good to hear from you. Okay, so we've got a little bit of time now to think about the questions that people ask. There were a few before breakout rooms, but please add more now and again if you can remember to put them in capitals then I can spot them quickly um, rather than just comments. Uh, James first question um, did you mean dairy or diary? <laughs> <laughs> yeah well spotted those who spotted the spelling mistake it was meant to be diary uh, sorry I'll correct that. <laughs> oh I quite enjoyed the comment about the person who lives um, around the corner from the Cumbria cow dairy I uh, uh, was going to book in there and all the people who wanted to join her yeah. so that sounds fun. Yeah. Okay, so question, first question goes, how will the age of congregation affect the timing of the recovery phase? Um, if you're a vicar and you're under 50 and most of your congregation are well over, how, how are you going to think about that? Yes, and, and this is why I think I was trying to suggest in, the, in, in what I was saying that the timing of recovery will differ from community to community. Um, and it will be impacted by how much the community has been impacted by COVID because some have been impacted much more than others. I think it will also um, vary according to the age of your community. Um, so if your congregation or your community is older, then it may well be that the recovery phase um, might start a little later um, or might start earlier, because if they get through that vaccination system pretty well and their confidence sort of begins to return, it might be a little earlier. I could see it going either way. And it's where we're going to need wisdom in our conversations with others that we lead with to try and work out, well, in our community, given what's happened, given who we are, we think now is the time to start rolling some of this stuff out. Thank you. Um, the sort of follow up to that is if you have a, an elderly congregation, um, how and maybe none of them are forward thinkers. All they want, James, is for everything to go back to normal. Um, how are we going to make sure that actually we use the opportunities brought by this time to bring um, healthy change? Yes, and that is a great question. And um, uh, um, I, in one sense, um, it may be there are some congregations where that is almost impossible to do. Uh, and just to recognize that actually that's a massive boulder to try and push uphill and instead to invite the congregation to support you in whatever small ways you might do it within your community and find, find the people of peace, find those who are looking for recovery, looking for help in processing their experience of the pandemic. So that would be one option. A second option would be this. Leadership is always about um, helping people to see what might be. And part of our job is constantly to remind people of the purpose of why the church exists. And every church loses connection with its reason for existence. And of course, a church's reasons for existence is given to us by Jesus. 
So one of the things we might want to do through Lent is do a preaching series. I noticed on the Padlet board somebody suggested that, uh, which just reconnects people with why are we here as a church and envisions them for the fact that we're not here just for ourselves. We're here for the community we're called to serve. And how might we make the most of the opportunity of serving our community at this time? So there would be a re-envisioning process of the people of God helping them to see who we are, why we exist, what we're about, what's important to us. And then just again within the congregation, seeing if there are a few, it may only be one or two who sort of catch the vision, join you and want actually to be outward looking on for things not to just be as they were in the past. So those would be two possible ways that we might take. Thank you. Um, James, what are we going to do if, if we start down this recovery road and then everything is interrupted? You know, maybe there's a, a new variant that spreads very fast or something happens to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. And I, and I, I, that's a very real possibility, which is why in this medium term, think long term, prepare medium term, plan short term, with, we're doing some work about preparing for a medium term possibility. We won't know whether to actually move that into something we action until we're much, much closer to the the start of when we think the recovery might happen. And then if we are in the recovery phase and, you know, sadly things go bad again and we have to go back into response phase rather than recovery, then I think all we can do is just acknowledge that reality. Um, it is likely to be messy rather than clean. Uh, it's likely that there will be some bumpy parts to the recovery, but as much as I think we can predict at the moment, that recovery phase will come and it's just trying to be ready for it when it's there. Yeah. Okay, there, there are a whole load of questions around um, maintaining the balance between online and on site. Yeah. Um, some people wondering whether it's okay just to film their services in church or whether they need to do something dedicated to those online. How on earth are we going to balance all of that stuff into the future? So um, we've been wondering about whether to do a webinar on uh, that uh, because it's a question that we've coming across quite a lot at the moment. Um, there are some good resources out there to help us thinking through this, uh, both theologically about what does it mean for us to be online and on site, uh, but also practically about whether actually it's realistic. And I think the reality is for some churches, both being online and on site is not going to be possible long term into the future because they simply don't have the resources at this point to make that happen. For other churches, it will be possible and it will be important because we've learned that there are some really um, helpful things about being online, particularly around accessibility and around reach and around ease of invitation. The ease there is within congregation members to simply link or like that actually connects wider communities to what we're offering. So again, one's going to need wisdom. Uh, are you in a place where the resources are there to make this possible? And if you are, we need to do some long term thinking about that as well. Think long term about this hybrid reality. And if you're interested, if you think a, a webinar on that would be of interest, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff done by the digital labs team at the Church of England um, do make use of their materials. But if you think we might be able to offer something into that space, then let us know and we'll see if we can pull together a webinar that specifically focuses on that topic. Thank you, James. There are a couple of questions around managing expectations. Um, one is about how do we manage people's expectations if they come back into church? Mm -hmm. And there's another delightful question. How do we help people um, come and face people again who maybe they just don't like? and they haven't had to see them face to face for a year, how are we going to manage all of that re-establishing of face to face uh, community in the building? So let me, if I may, just take the expectations question, first of all. Um, you, for those who've been on our webinars before, you'll know that we uh, produce a little resource handout following the webinar. Uh, and on it, there's a link to a little guide we produced to handling expectations earlier on in the pandemic. So I, I simply want to refer you to that guide because it's such an important issue. And in the guide, we just talked through about how to manage expectations of others and uh, our own uh, in this whole process. With regard to the second question about people you know, having to come back to face-to-face -to -face contact with maybe those they don't like, 
Gosh, that is a good one. Um, I'm not sure I've got a good answer to that, but let me just offer one little reflection. Um, as the people of God, we are a community that believes in diversity and grace. We believe that all people are welcome uh, and we believe grace is what welds us together. And therefore, part of our job as leaders of churches is to help people embrace the reality that we are a sinful community of people, but we're also a diverse community of people. We're not all the same. In fact, that's the thing I love about the church. Um, I think one of the great privileges of being ordained is when one is distributing the bread and the wine, you giving it to this amazing array of people who probably in no other context in the world would either actually gather and meet with one another. And inevitably that means there are gonna be some you might like and some you might not like, some you get on with and some you don't get on with. And part of our job is to, to envision people to say, this is who we are as the people of God and what holds us together is grace. It's loving one another forgiving one another, carrying one another's burdens, those wonderful one another verses of the New Testament. And um, in that community of the church, we learn how to be disciples of Jesus because we are different and we don't always get on and have to learn how to grow in Christ-like character, grow in love, grow in forgiveness and grow in a desire to bless and serve others. So it may be tough for people to get back to folks they don't like so well, but actually I want to say that's part of what it means to be church. It's part of how we grow as disciples of Jesus, and it's therefore our training place for living out our discipleship in the rest of the world. A couple of questions about sort of the, the bigger um, emotional movements, if you like, going across the country. There's going to be a lot of grief and pain. Yeah. Um, and we're also talking about connecting with our communities. Can you say anything more about how we can be prepared uh, to help people in our churches and outside to deal with that? So in a sense, that's what this whole uh, topic, uh, this webinar is about and the resources we've produced are about because we recognize that. So for example, on the little sheets we've created for people to use in their homes, uh, there's a whole section on lament. And we give a little bit of guidance as to how people might lament well. And this, folks, is where we are in such a good place, because as we've talked about, particularly on the last webinar, actually, within our tradition, we have the resources for lament, for thanksgiving, for, for, for reflection and restoration, because they're a part of how we understand life and our faith and how it intersects with life. Um, the Psalms obviously being one of the great resources for us. So yes, uh, I know some people have described it as a tsunami of grief and anxiety. Uh, and I think we need to be ready to help people recover. What a great opportunity for us to put, as I suggested, the church at the center of the community and Christ at the center of people's lives. Um, uh, so let's make use of the resources that we have within our tradition to help people. Thank you. And someone's pointed out in the chat very helpfully, James, that people are often angry yep. um, when life is very hard and that clergy can be the target for that anger. Yes. And we maybe need to spot when the anger is genuinely at us and, and just being things being taken out. Yes. I think, um, again, on the last webinar, I talked about the three common reactions that clergy are experiencing at the moment are anxiety amongst their people, anger amongst their people, and this strange word, axedia. Um, and if you want to learn more about those three things, then look back at the previous webinar and the resources we've offered. OK, a um, church leaders question, particularly Church of England. Um, there may well be diocesan reorganisation going on now or dioceses are thinking of cutting their numbers of stipendiary clergy. How do we stay hopeful in the middle of all of that? Mm. Well, there's an obvious answer, which um, in a sense can sound glib, but I think we need to say, which is our hope needs to rest in God. Um, and forgive me if that sounds a little glib, but, but that is where our hope is, isn't it? Uh, think of our sisters and brothers in other parts of the world who are in much more dire situations than most of us will be in here. And they are the ones who've taught me about hoping God in the midst of huge struggle and suffering, uh, trials and difficulties. 
So ultimately, our hope needs to be in him and we need to turn to him and, and ask him to help us be people of hope that his spirit brings hope to our lives. Second way of reflecting on that question would be this. Um, I think it's, it is inevitably going to be the case there's going to be quite a lot of dioceses where reorganisation is going to occur. Certainly the conversations I've had with diocesan staff over these last few weeks are indicating that that is the case. And some of that is going to be painful and difficult for those who are on the receiving end. I have two friends who've just been made redundant by a diocese and uh, it's a tough time for them. And within all of that, the church will continue. So there may be changes in our structures, but the church is not going to go down the pan. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ will continue. And so somehow we need to be looking for ways to, to get behind whatever may be wise ways forward for the future that recognises some of the economic challenges that we face and see if we can be a part of supporting and encouraging those who are making those difficult decisions, uh, supporting those who are at the receiving end of those difficult decisions and keeping our hope alive by both looking to God and trusting that Jesus will continue to build his church and will use it to be a blessing to his world. Thank you, James. And then um, have you got any tips on how we can bring back to church those who've just got out of the habit of meeting on a Sunday, um, either online or in person? Yeah, my, my main tip uh, has always been and continues to be contact them personally. Uh, and I know that's time consuming, but have a conversation with them personally, phone them up, um, go for a socially distanced walk with them, whatever would be appropriate, and uh, go with an inquiring, not a judgmental attitude. Go with a, how's it been? What's been going on in your life? Rather than, why haven't you been turning up? Uh, because you'll probably discover a story. And in the discovery of the story, you may well be able to be a help and support to them, whatever they have been going through. And invite them back, invite them back. Um, uh, because uh, people who've got out of the habit can get back in the habit. And that's what we want to invite them to do. Um, just one more before we finish, James. Any tips for helping church schools as we go maybe into a recovery phase? What, what can we do? So one of the things I would suggest is make use of some of these resources. And Pam, for a minute, in a moment, we can show folks them. Uh, make use of some of these resources we've created by um, uh, distributing them through your school's network. Um, for example, I know a, a, a person locally here who contacted the school and said, uh, we've got this thing that we'd like to offer into all, all the families of the school. Would you be prepared to send it out in your weekly email to parents? And the school was very happy to do that. And so instantly they distributed throughout the school community um, a little resource that they thought would be helpful for people at this time. And, and some of the resources that we've created, I think, could be distributed in that way. Invitations to some of the recovery events, ways of actually uh, and, and drawing people into what we have to offer. Great to make use of the school contacts that we have. Thank you. We've got just a couple of minutes. Do you want to say anything else about resources, James? Before Yeah, we um, if I may, uh, what I'd just like to do is... Um, let me just uh, do this. I just want to show you uh, where you can find. So let me just share my screen uh, from the right screen to share. So if you go uh, to our website and um, we're going to send you a, a handout uh, 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 with all these resources linked to it. But if you go to our website, which I hope you can see on the screen uh, now, um, if you just go to the webinar page leading into the future and under leading through recovery, all the resources I've talked about, that's uh, materials for a church service, for an online Zoom event around recovery, some slides that you can share with leaders to help them understand the process, the my pandemic experience for a church, a community, and for a family, um, the Lord's Prayer and Psalm 42, which are related to some of the things that we've put. Uh, they're all there, all downloadable for you and uh, all accessible for you. Now, you'll also get a handout we're going to send to you with links to all of those things directly on it as well. So there's a couple of ways that you can access the resources and please distribute them widely. We've deliberately created them in that way. Thank you, James. 
folks, thank you. It is 11 o'clock. We will stay around for a bit for further questions, but we need to finish very soon. Um, thank you so much for coming. If you'd like to join us next month, month our webinar, webinar dates are the 16th of March at 10 and 2 and the 25th of March at 2, and you can book in on the website as usual. We're also running our popular PCC Tonight event on the 2nd of March for clergy and all PCC members. Again, there are details coming up in the chat for that one. Um, we'd love it if you could fill in a feedback form for us so we know how we're getting on with those. Uh, and we will stay around for another 20 minutes or so for further questions. So if I haven't um, yet asked your question, do stay. But for the moment, let's just pray. Loving God, we thank you for your calling on our lives to serve you and to serve your people, to grow the kingdom. And we pray, Lord, that each one of us will remember from today the two or three things you need us to concentrate on. So may your blessing rest on each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. So we're going to carry on with questions. If I've missed your question and you want to repost it so I spot it, then please do. Um, James, just uh, resources for clergy who are feeling really quite tired by everything at the moment. What could we specifically recommend? So a number of retreat houses are doing online quiet days or retreats, and uh, that would be a great way to just restore yourself a little bit. Um, uh, Google your favourite sort of retreat house or or um, a, a retreat center, and you may well find some really helpful things that are being done online. And secondly, a number of dioceses are offering things for those who are in the Anglican context uh, uh, around quiet days or, or reflective experiences. And thirdly, there are a whole bunch of resources that have been created to help clergy process what's going on. And on our resources sheets from previous webinars we've often listed some of those and on the padlet boards that we've used all sorts of people have put very helpful resources on there so there's quite a bit out there that one could connect with that might help um, if none of those uh, are things that um, appeal my encouragement would be put some time in the diary to just be still and with god and find somebody to talk stuff through with. Those are the two probably most helpful things that we could do. And on the question of resources, uh, just are we planning to do uh, further PCC tonight sessions for when people have had more time this year with their PCC? Yes, there's gonna be one coming up in the summer term uh, and one coming up in uh, the autumn term and the dates will be released uh, pretty soon. Great. Thank you. Uh, and again, on resources, are we planning to do a children's and young people version of the My Pandemic experience? Yes. So we, in the end, we felt that it was probably best for children to process with their parents, which is why we created the Our Family experience. The idea is a family does this together, particularly adults with younger children. With regard to young people, sort of um, 11 pluses, um, we, we would... Uh, to be perfectly honest, we created all these in the last uh, three days um, and we just uh, ran out of time to do any more. But we could well give some um, thought to in the next few days doing a, a youth one. And if we do, we'll put that up on the same place so you can access it from the same place on our website. Thank you. Um, I think I've come to the end of the questions from the chat. Uh, if you would now like to ask a question, please post it now or or unmute yourself uh, and do speak to us. And just while people are doing that, if I can just emphasize what I said earlier on with the pandemic experience sheets that we've created on the back here where it says church contact, you can pipe in your contact details, then resave the file. And then when you send it out, it will go out with your contact details on it because these are editable PDFs. So people can actually type into them if they want to. But you need to put your church contact details on there or, or somebody's details if you want to do that, whether it's your website or an email address or a, a telephone number. So that if folks want to contact you, they can do that. Make sure you do that before you send them out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, apparently, recovery model is... Um... A, a very normal thing in mental health treatments um, and uh, Becky all right just wanted us to know about that Becky did you want to say any more about it yeah just there's a lot of learning there um so recovery can look very different for very dif for different people um you know the classic thing would be a sort of 
bank manager who recovers the relationship with his family having had a nervous breakdown or something but it could be um somebody recovers physically their meant their, their strength as they recover from a period of depression or something um so it's, it's it can be a lifetime process recovery rather than a short phase to get through yeah. um and i think um there's quite a lot of common sense stuff available through mental health charities and things that would be worth people um being aware of it came in because there was a medical model of either you're ill or you're fixed type of thing yeah. the social model says um it's all to do with your parents and you'll never recover because you're abused when you're three or whatever and so the recovery model sort of saying you know you're, you're always going to have your childhood issues um and if you've got a propensity to depression you're always going to have to live with that but what does that actually mean in reality um and what does that look like and so that's the sort of it was quite groundbreaking back in the 90s um but it's not probably as talked about now i don't know because i'm out of touch but that that's sort of quite a useful model thank you becky um on that someone says what type of recovery services or events would you run for the community i think people will find that uh, more about that in the guides that we're sending but in the light of what you say becky it, it's not just a one-off yeah. thing you know this is this is a long-term process and will look different for every person and we'll call on all the pastoral skills that we can muster ourselves and from other leaders yes pam that lovely guide that you've created for how we might when it's possible use our space to aid recovery i think one of the lovely things about that is people can come back multiple times uh, it's not just that they might use that space once they might might use it on a weekly basis if, if we can make it available on a weekly basis uh, and over a period of weeks and months in the process of reflecting on the pandemic and, and their own recovery journey using some of the resources that are offered within that space so I think that's a really helpful thing you've put together anybody else got any questions that we've missed or that have occurred to you now please um, unmute and just ask them or put them in the chat ask a question about um so I, I missed some uh, the last five minutes because the plumber turned up um <laughs> but i have a congregation that um has had a complex history and struggles with reflection because there's shame caught up in it mm. so is there i i it's just a long slow process mm. but they really really struggle with reflection and i understand how important it is mm anything that might help a congregation that is struggling with the past and now suddenly you've got a yeah. pandemic to deal with as well yeah thanks karen and, and i'm no expert on this so it'd be great to hear other people's advice either in the chat or, or unmute yourselves but but my one thought is this um if we can do some limited reflection um, or focused reflection specifically around a joint experience that we've all had i.e the pandemic it might open up the possibility for wider and broader reflection in the future so this could be a a positive experience for the congregation who are struggling to reflect because of their big past by limiting the reflection on a very limited past i.e um, <clears throat> Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this last 12 months and our experience of it. And the other way, the other important thing would be don't use the word reflection when you introduce it. Uh, choose to use different language if the language of reflection is automatically a blockage for them. And then potentially if you can just and make it as simple as possible, if you can just give them a, 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 a walk them through that bit of, I'm going to use the word reflection at the moment, but that bit of reflection. I, I think that could be a healing experience for them, not only related to the pandemic, but also to the bigger history and open up possibilities for the future. There's some comments in the chat, James, about how community memories are very, very long. Yeah. So all of us, in, to some extent or other, have to deal with the past history of our yeah. churches and, and getting things out into the open gently and kindly yeah. can be a way to help lay things down or sometimes a specific service for that process. Yeah. Um, what about sermon series uh, that you might find answers to this um, on the Padlet board, but any suggestions for sermon series on recovery and re-envisioning? 
Yes, um, so on the Padlet board is a, a really helpful suggestion about using Nehemiah uh, with some ideas about some of the themes in Nehemiah working very well for this recovery phase. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a, a good one. Um, uh, I, I know that there are um, various materials that people have been putting together and sharing in a variety of places around themes and series that could be used. So you'll find some people are using Lent for this. And if you go to the Facebook group, which is called something like COVID Church Lent and Easter, um, it's an open Facebook group. Uh, there are all sorts of resources and ideas being published there about how Lent might be used well, uh, Lent and Easter be used well for, th for this. Um, and if you've got resources, please do go to the Padlet board and pop them on there so that all of us can benefit from it. Do go back to the Padlet board because we've got two more webinars and they're going to contribute to it as well. So at the end of the week, it'll be worth going back to it and see what other ideas have gone up, not just the ones from today, but also ones from later on uh, uh, from other people as well. Someone's recommending creative arts as a, a way to come through recovery, but also projects together. Yeah. Um, doing a building or painting project when the time comes, we're allowed to do those sorts of things, uh, helps people. Um, Someone said they're putting out posters around the site uh, on the theme of hope, which is po um, positive for the whole community. It's called Hope on the Railings. I like that. That's great. And, and I saw a lovely poster a church had created, uh, which, which basically was very, very clever, very simple. But it, 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 it in essence, um, had a QR code on it and a text number and an email address. And it basically said, look, if you, want, if you, um, if you would like somebody uh, to pray uh, about something, um, then use any of these three means to contact us. And, and they plastered them around their community and they had a good number of people from outside of the church who texted in or emailed in to say, yeah, I'd love you to be praying for me, please. Um, so it's just another way of connecting, isn't it? Another way of building relationship and, and offering hope at this time. Thank you so much. Any more questions, folks? Yes, I, I, can I ask one if that's all yes, right? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, I, I think my, in my context, um, my PCC and I've got quite a lot of uh, fully engaged people um, who, are, you know, I, I'm, I'm more of a reflective, contemplative character, but I've got quite a lot of people who are more of the visionary, let's get out there and go. Um, and I sort of listening to the seminar, I think in my context, I might have the PCC pushing for entering the reconstruction phase yeah. already. Yeah. Um, and what my question is, do you think it would be bad to do that uh, and, uh, and almost run the, ref the kind of recovery and reconstruction together? Or do you think I should be sort of trying to hold people back a bit and say, look, yeah. we're, we're trying to move too quickly? Great question, Thomas. Thank you. Um, Simon Barrington suggests that in an ideal world, when a crisis comes in those three things, response, recovery and reconstruction, you'd have a little team working on each of those different levels with the right sort of gifts. Now, of course, most of us are not in the luxurious position of having enough people to do that. But if you've got some people now who are more the strategic visionary thinkers who are interested in the reconstruction, I would empower them, create a little group of two or three people to do some of that thinking now. A, that will engage them and that will be good. It, it, B, uh, they'll be doing some long-term thinking that will be really helpful for you when you head towards the reconstruction phase. And C, what it will do is um, they will almost certainly come up with lots of good ideas about what the new future might look like. However, um, on the, um, I'm just trying to remember whether I put it here and I'm just checking. Um, Dum, 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 dum. I thought I had, uh, I've certainly put it somewhere. Oh, I know, I put it on the Guide for Leading Through Recovery uh, handout. Um, I've put a little article in there by somebody who's saying, be wary of rushing to reconstruction without first doing recovery. Now, these things are going to be overlapped, but I would be a little bit wary of simply going from here response to reconstruction without doing some of that recovery phase um, and and the article is in the guide that we've created for leading through this time and that might just be a help as you think about this and also it could be something you could share with the reconstruction people to say i'm really excited about the reconstruction phase i'm really excited you're going to be doing some stuff on this can i can i encourage you to do that but let me just offer you this as an explanation why we also need to do some work on the recovery phase first 
I hope that helps, Thomas. Thank you. Anybody else, folks? Anybody else going to, they'd like to either question or desperate to say? Yes, please do share your insights and thoughts. It's all, we're now down to almost a single page, which is great. Yeah. So it'll be yeah. a bit more interactive. Do you unmute yourself and say something? No, I think it's all quiet, James. In that case, we'll bring things to a close. Thank you so much for coming. We look forward to seeing you maybe next month um, for our next lot of webinars. And we hope you found this useful. Lovely to see you folks. Um, and we will just... Own. We'll yep. just pop the um, link to the feedback form back in the chat because we are really grateful for feedback. It just helps us to work out what to do better next time. So if you've got a moment to do that, that would be wonderful. Great to see you all. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye bye. Care. God bless. Bye bye. bye, -bye.